my own Cyclica Association, the alumni, and I have the absolute pleasure today to introduce Megan Quinn. So Megan Quinn graduated from Stuart Home in 1981 and is regarded as a global game changer and one of Australia's leading businesswomen. Alumni Megan Quinn was a co-founder of luxury online retailer, Yes Porter. Quickly, quickly establishing it as an international brand. With a renewed preparedness to constructively challenge the status quo, combined with a keen intellect, humanity and integrity, Megan has worked internationally across several industries and disciplines. Her first job as a junior art director took her to London, where she started her other company, Partners in Wine, as a dare. Hope we get more about that. Since returning to Australia, Megan has acted as a senior advisor, mentor, and international keynote speaker, and now sits on boards for four market leading listed companies. She previously served on the board and national committee for UNICEF Australia and fitted for work, a not for profit organisation supporting and empowering disadvantaged women. She's a role model to young women and men, demonstrating that harnessing our unique even the ones that avoid our teachers at school, can create a rewarding path in life. So without further ado, I'd like to invite me to the stage. I'd also like to invite Alex, who is our president of the International Association of Alumni and Alumni of South Africa, long title, to begin our fireside chat. So I went to Stuart Home 
Sister Carol is here. Thank you, Sister, for that beautiful grace. And the nuns and teachers. Marvi Ruddy was standing at the top of the drive the first day, which is incredibly thoughtful, welcomed me and took me straight into this beautiful group of welcoming young girls. And we were just two classes of 24. There were 40, 48 of us in, in year 12. And the teachers and students just let us be who we are. Um, accepting who we are, not trying to change us, celebrating it. Um, what the All Hallows nuns would have seen as disruptive and laughing and thinking differently, which had annoyed some of my teachers, they, they let me, they celebrated it. And my sense of humor was celebrated. And particularly, um, Mrs. Moon, my year 12 art teacher, whom unfortunately passed away last year, was an exceptional, she was my hero teacher. She gave me permission to be me. She, um, she was just an extraordinary influence in my life. So I had that beautiful memories, beautiful friendships from, from this incredibly special school. Um, I'd grown up in a, um, a, in a family of business people, but we'd also had women, you know, husbands, you know, I didn't die over there actually, and the women um, ran the, the hotels. So I'd always seen women leaders, you know, as I said, friends at school, Lee Ford, Lee's mother was president of Zonto and went on to be governor. Nick Lackinson's mother was the first Lord Mayor of Brisbane, Lorraine Marsh, and I had my mum's friends. And she had this incredible group of women, so I never saw my gender as a barrier. I'd seen it, Patsy Wolf, you know, another one. I'd seen these strong, beautiful women who didn't, you know, didn't give up their femininity, had families, and, and um, so I just got on with it. So I never actually let my gender, I never saw it as an I was very lucky, you know, they say if you can see it, you can be it. Um, I was sent to London, I was incredibly lucky. We had fantastic clients to start off. In, um, we were in a little shopping suite just off um, Oxford Street, and um, it's in Christmas Place. We had brilliant clients, at which we systematically lost over the years because Mo and Joe wanted to put jingles into the UK, and you know, they were way too sophisticated for that. So, lost the job in the beginning of the recession, and um, I called mum and said, this is a problem. I lost my job, I was the first one of all my friends, advertised as the first one in the recession to go, you know, doctors, lawyers, architects, bankers, they all had their jobs. Mum said, I always thought you'd be a good receptionist. <laughs> <laughs> EA, and you know, at, at Netta Porter, I had two EAs at the same time, that's how useless I am. Um, and so I went off for an interview um, to be a receptionist, and they left me in this room, came back half an hour later, and they said, you haven't done anything. I said, no, I actually can't do anything. I can't even answer the phone. I can't type. I can't use the computer. She said, why are you here? I said, I just want to sit in the reception of one of those beautiful banks you see in movies <laughs> and greet people. And so I did. They, she sent the boss in, and the boss in, he was the only male um, in the building, and said, you know, you're taking the mickey. And I said, no, I actually just want to greet people. And so I started a new guest, Phillips and Drew, and uh, I, because, you know, mum had always fought most of the night address well, I always presented well, so I didn't have to wear the uniform. They ended up putting me on the executive floor, and I would greet people and put all the good looking men on that side, which is this is my better side, and all the women and the other men on that side. But they ended up offering me jobs right across the bank. Um, and it wasn't because, it was my attitude. It was that joy I brought, it was that positivity, and um, they offered to train me and offered, you know, all of these things. And I just thought, I can't sell people things that I don't believe in. I don't want to actually be a banker. I would have made some money. So I had nothing. So I quit in a recession, sharing a flat in, in Chelsea. And so I needed a, a job. And I went out, what do you do when you're young? Right? You celebrate, <laughs> you drink, because you know, don't have any responsibilities. I was uh, 26. And I went out with my friends, and all of the boys started teasing me. Oh, you could be a prima ballerina, which I clearly did. Oh, you could be a supermodel, which I clearly did. And they kept going, oh, how we laughed. And eventually I got sick of it, and Paul Kelly said, you could be a char, which is a cleaning lady. And I said, I could do anything. So the next day, unfortunately, I ended up a cleaning lady. And as mum will attest, I didn't do any cleaning at home. It was useless. I started a cleaning company, and I called it Partners in Grime. I wanted to, I lived in Chelsea, so I just wanted to do Chelsea, Belgravia, Mayfair, Kensington. I just wanted to, I didn't want to go into geeky areas. <laughs> and um, I had, because I was a designer, I designed a logo that said CIMTG, and everyone all my clients assumed it was some big international cleaning association, and it just meant cleanliness next to gorgeous. <laughs> and so, but because when I started it, I just thought, I can't, I've always thought, if I'm going to do this, I have to be the best. You know, there's no point doing it and not being the best. So I wanted to be the best cleaning company in this area. 
and I sold and then I went into contract publishing and, and then started the dot com when I was coming in. So, sorry, I was really not nuts. <laughs> <laughs> what were you um, happy to listen. Um, so we had the pleasure of chatting just before this event and uh, I got to hear the lovely then foray from that side all the way into Neto Porte and uh, how you managed to design that experience mm. where there was a gap in the industry. Yeah. Could you just talk to what was so different about what you were doing then um, in terms of some of those things there? Sure, sure. So when I left Condé Nast, I, I took my EA with me and I was going to start a luxury branding agency in London. Um, and, and as I was leaving, the managing director who used to call me Angel back in the days when men could call female employees Angel. He said, Angel, promise me one thing. You learn how to use a computer because your career won't go anywhere if you can't use a computer. And I just said, no, it's not going to, I'm just not interested. So the next thing I did was co-found a dot com. So I didn't want to be stuck behind a computer. I didn't think that, and there's nothing wrong with that, but for me, it wouldn't be the right place for me to be. So I still couldn't design or do much on the computer, but when Natalie, uh, Natalie Rudy was a, a friend and she was going up with a guy called Arno Massonet, who was a banker at Lehman Brothers, which used to be a bank, and uh, she worked at Tatler and, and that my then boyfriend was a banker, but he was doing um, studies, uh, feasibility studies into investing in dot coms, because in London at the time, it was enormous. It was like the gold rush. Everybody was talking about it in tubes, restaurants, no matter, ta you know, taxi drivers. It was just an extraordinary time, a privilege to be there at this time. And, you know, when I saw it, everyone was saying, this is extraordinary. And I didn't actually have the foresight to see the potential. I was looking at eBay and Amazon just thinking, that is disgusting. <laughs> you know, that is not where I would choose to spend my time. It looked like it had been designed by skateboarding male teens, which it had, you know, blokes really were the only ones who worked in, in uh, you know, technology and digital agencies at the time. So when Natalie approached me about this idea she had of setting up this little business called What's New Pussycat in London, and you know, from her kitchen table, she'd just had a baby, Isabella, and she wanted pink packaging, and I, I'm not very into pink, and uh, what's new for Sika? I was so thrilled when we couldn't get that name. <laughs> but it was like, okay, this, this is pretty amazing. If we can make this luxury, she'd worked at Tatler, she knew designers, she knew Anya Hangmark, she knew Jimmy Choo. We thought we could you know, convince them to come with us. Because I grew up here in Brisbane, and um, you know, Reed, mum was always, uh, you know, has impeccable taste and great design, so we'd have interior design magazines and fashion magazines, and, but all of the stockists back in the day were in Sydney and Melbourne. So, you know, mum would fly down sometimes and, you know, for my confirmation dress, we, you know, went down to Sydney. And, and so I knew that there were people around the world who didn't have access to these amazing stores. You know, we've got everything, you've got everything here in Brisbane now. But it was that accessibility, inclusivity. You know, I've never been uh, stick thin so sometimes you go into these shops and you feel a little self-conscious and it's always frustrating when they don't have your size, when you've made that effort to go in, um, you know, accessibility. If you are just had a baby or you're in hospital or at work or just, you know, tired from a long day, you didn't have to do, have a pedicure to go and try on shoes. So I knew that there was a market everywhere um, for women and because I hadn't been on the internet, I went and spent two days in an internet cafe with people who were on the internet. Because if I did it at home, I just would have shut it and just thought that was so revolting. So I went amongst people who really loved it. And I went back to Natalie and Anno and Mark two days later. We were talking about what's new pussycat in London and I said, I'm going to, only going to be involved if we're going to be the best in the world because the internet is disgusting and it needs to change. <laughs> and so all of a sudden, and Mark said then, uh, and this was 99, said, he thought he could devise a taxes and duties paid, um, inclusive in the price, which was groundbreaking because, you know, 24 years ago when you used to have things delivered from FedEx, so you'd get a bill five days later, which put a real sting in the tail. It meant that women in Australia and Brazil and 
you know, Uganda would see in their currency what the final amount would be and there'd be no surprises, no sting in the tail. So that was, none of us had worked in retail, um, you know, hadn't worked in cleaning, hadn't worked in retail. We didn't let that stop us. In, in fact, it just gave us the opportunity to reinvent retail and to make it better for women everywhere. And I knew what we, you know, Natalie had always worked in Tatler and W Magazine in the States. So she knew how to talk to a fashion consumer. Um, but she didn't earn much because they never paid much. On the other hand, I'd worked in advertising in the 80s, earned a lot, have always had excruciatingly expensive taste, unfortunately. So I was familiar with those service levels of the handsome doorman at Gucci opening the door and going into a Prada changing room and having champagne and, and the beautiful ambiance of a, a money store, you know, interior and architecturally designed. They were beautiful. We were expecting women in 2000 to give up all of that, you know, that free song walking down the street with shopping bags. Trust us and go on to a computer. And so that was a huge leap of faith. And also we needed to convince brands to come to us, so we needed to earn their trust. So um, we needed to design a beautiful site, so it was pairing it back, pairing it back. So there was, you know, I, I could go on forever, but you know, women, I was watching women's eyes when they were on the internet as well, and men's eyes were jumping and their mouse was clicking, whereas women's eyes were gliding and their mouse was gliding. So I d designed the site, which looked a bit different to how it does now, but then it evolved with that in mind, how, how we might want to use. And because we weren't so familiar with the internet to make it as intuitive as possible, you know, getting the brands, convincing the brands, we would tell them, Natalie would say, well, we'll have designer focus and we can talk about the provenance and the influences, but it was all talk. We needed to actually show them how we were going to set these new standards that nobody had seen anywhere in the world, which is why I designed the packaging I did. And I've never designed packaging, but we don't let that stop us. So it was the millennium I started, um, you know, designing engineered boxes but that would have been as alienating as a computer for our customers. So I went back to a little illustration in the 50s of a bellhop. You, you probably will have all seen this. It's a little boy with a, a, a little cap jauntily and he's walking along Park Avenue with a tumbling pile of boxes. And I thought, that's what we need. We need to go back to tr traditional levels of service and experience and boxes. This is the only tangible thing our customers were going to have, so designed rigid boxes, they're just boxes, but they were handmade rigid boxes, which is so impractical for any business because you can't flat pack them. Then I didn't want them to feel like cardboard, so I had it hand covered in balacron, which kind of felt a bit like vinyl, actually, but still, it was better than cardboard. And then, um, and every box that was delivered, I would open with Cerebell and check so that you couldn't see the, you know, the connections or you couldn't see any glue and if we did, we sent it back so that our suppliers would understand the standards that we, we expected for ourselves. Then the ribbon we used was from um, a Japanese ribbon making house called Mokaba and I had a fashion design student, um, Fleur, who was um, at Royal, um, Central St. Martins and she would make Petersham bows for the right side of every box or a handmade rosette for every bag that was delivered within three hours of an order since June 10, 2000. So this is how we convince the brands and this is how we convince women to actually forego those experiences in store and actually it was a present to yourself if you get it. And, and you know, I, we still have all the box, the black boxes and they're not made quite as well. Now, when you've got a million orders, you know, it, it's hard to maintain those standards and the costs and things. Um, and then, of course, the service um, had to be impeccable. And, and what was, we didn't want any stings in the tail. I was from Brisbane. If I'm shopping from Brisbane and I've ordered from London or New York, what if I don't like it? So we decided to make returns free, which was a huge risk in 2000 for a, you know, a young company we had. Competitors in, at, the period, at that time in the dot-com boom who had hundreds of millions or tens of millions of pounds and we had investment, startup um, investment. We had 800,000 pounds of friends and family money. And actually, I tried to get dad to invest 100,000 
pounds and he said no he said no woman would spend that sort of money on clothes and I said you're an idiot your wife your daughters everyone does you know <laughs> investors would say no woman would spend 400 pounds in a handbag and Natalie and I would be kicking our bags under the tables hoping the boys wouldn't ask us so you know, that's why we went down the friends and family route because the bankers at the time were all males and they didn't understand our spending capacity <laughs> on ourselves. <laughs> I'll stop. I'll let you keep talking, sorry. I, I did like the note that you told me that the people that you chose to deliver those gifts oh, yeah. in the first little while were good looking men. <laughs> really, really, it's in the days you could do that. And so we'd have these great looking young guys in black net porte t-shirts walking through offices with these beautiful black bags with their handmade rosettes or delivering them to women, you know, at their lunch parties. And, uh, and that's what we actually had the Daily Mail approaches in the early days, which is a huge newspaper big circulation for our most expensive coat at the time. I'll never forget, it was a Marc Jacobs coat for two and a half thousand pounds. Now they sell things for 120,000 pounds, but that was a big deal for us back then. And everyone was so excited. It's like, my God, Daily Mail on us. And I was like, no, that's too mass market. We have to stay at the top. We have to position ourselves with this women. And then, you know, then, because we were trying to establish ourselves as a luxury brand. And so we needed to, create that sort of um, club-like feel. But there was also this accessibility. Everyone could come shopping here. Um, and you know, then we started dividing our customers into groups. We had some women, um, actually princesses, in the same palace, they were sisters, but they clearly lived at opposite ends of the palace because they would buy very similar things all the time. Uh, it, actually, tragically, it turns out that they were actually prisoners in the palace. Um, we didn't realise any of this though, but, um, but we had women spending an absolute fortune on 9-11. Um, our shopping in New York went nuts, which really surprised us because half, you know, nationally, Claudia and Sojin, who were on the buying team before I joined it, they were in New York at the shows, you know, it was devastating, but our women were scared, they couldn't leave their homes, and they just wanted to feel normal. Um, so, they, so they went shopping at net porte and same during the first Gulf War, our, you know, women in Kuwait. Um, I, you know, some of us will remember the BBC interviewers with the gas masks, you know, reporting and you'd see flashing lights behind them and we go, oh, there's DHL. They're going into Kuwait, you know, delivering because women just wanted to feel normal and safe and it's a, so it kind of had, there's a very emotional thing with fashion as well. You know, some people think it's, it's, it's shallow, uh, but it, to me, it's always been a self-expression and a celebration of design and, and yeah, in, you know, inclusion and, you know, it makes us feel good, right? So, so yeah, so I'll, I'll let you keep talking, sorry. Very long answers. So obviously you've had a, a raft of experience and uh, love for education uh, in different, of living life as education as well. Do you think, how do you think the, um, you know, getting exposed to different environments and, and being immersed in um, things that aren't necessarily a wheelhouse or, or being able to learn on the go has that, um, that mode of confidence to try when you haven't had all the knowledge yeah. in the back pocket? That's a good question um, because I dropped out of university at convincing twice. And, um, and interestingly, my two daughters who are 22 and 19 are reeling a little bit too in, in the university environment. And um, so I, I just, yeah, I, I have forged this career by observing. I hear a lot of people trying to forget where they've come from and forget, you know, move on up through the glass ceiling and keep, I gather all of this information. I've never done social media or I've never agreed with it. So whilst everyone's been watching their phones, I've been watching them and observing and I, which is where the equity you know, comes into it as a board director. I mean, who would have thought that I would be a, a board director on you know, two of Australia's biggest company, or you know, the top ASX 40, and, um, and you know, one that's in all sorts of strife. And, uh, but anyway, um, and, but you know, I, it's because I go through doors that are open, I'm open to opportunities, and that's very different to when you're young, you know, we were in our mid-30s, which isn't that young actually, when we started Netaporte, 
but we were only just starting our journeys with children. And so we didn't have like, it, I've had, I've come up with lots of business ideas in the last 10 years since being back in Australia, but I haven't done them because my family needed me and I didn't have, you know, so it, it's not, I, some people say to me, you know, you're so brave, I could never do it, but the circumstances were right at the time. But, so to answer your question, it's just not feeling less. I, I think now, finally, I, I, I bring a diversity of thought, a different way of thinking that was celebrated at Stuart Home. Um, and I just run with that. And I don't think I'm better than anyone, and I certainly don't think I'm less than any, anyone either. And I think when I'm on, you know, around these tables or advising these companies, it's just that having being brave enough to actually trust your intuition and, and going with it because we all have, it's free, <laughs> we all have it. There's so much, you know, to trust your gut instinct and, and lead with, um, you know, I always want to make things better for having been there. And if I, you know, if you don't think you can meta porte being the best, um, it had to be the best in the world, otherwise what was the point? Um, you know, it had to exceed the expectations of our customers and our friends and family investors and our team members because, you know, they were taking a risk coming to us. I was also the chief of staff. When you're in a startup, you have all these different hats. So I was creative director and chief of staff and a senior buyer um, and, and then a board director. But, you know, when I was hiring people, I couldn't expect them to have degrees because I didn't have them. So what I was looking for was these amazing attitudes where we would all kind of fold in together. The rigidity of hierarchy had no place in a startup because you need to be so agile and you need to move together and you need to communicate. So in the kitchen, when I found our second building, because we were growing so exponentially, we had one big table in the kitchen so that we were all sitting together. So what if you were precious packing boxes and the CFO would be sitting together and learning from each other, chatting about their day. Um, actually, that's another thing I used to do. <laughs> Back in the day when I designed the packaging, I didn't want any tape on the paper. I didn't, that just seemed a bit mundane. It's, it's like, you know, when we had the VIP customers, I thought, oh, VIP is too mundane. We want, they're a bit more special than that. So it's like, they're extremely important people. So they were EIPs, they're still EIPs to this day. There was often a lot of humor in what we were doing, that kind of lightness to make people feel joyous. But when we were packaging, I would go out and spot open a box or two every couple of days just to make sure that our standards weren't slipping so that every single person, whether she spent, couldn't buy much for 20 pounds actually, but you know, 100 pounds or you know, 10,000 pounds was getting the same extraordinary experience of being part of an Etaporte. So I think it's just that preparedness to not feel less. If you go in with good intention, to contribute and to make things better, you actually get away with a lot and a sense of humour. I've gotten away with so much because of my sense of humour. <laughs> so, you know, even around the board table, um, having a sense of humour is, is a good thing. In times like this, you know, good times and in bad makes good times better and bad times more tolerable. So, mm. and and I guess I've, I've heard that you've had a number of different challenges over your years, yeah. and that humour that's always been present through that. Why has that been so disarming to people around you, do you think? I just think, well, I, I guess, um, you know, after my divorce, uh, Nikki Kemmel, who's a writer, not only Australian, but she's an author, she wrote me this beautiful card when I was leaving England. And I'll never forget it. It was, it was very touching and she just said, I'd just like to acknowledge your grace and humour through this. Um, and, you know, she's learned a lot. And so I guess, you know, Dad has a, a, an incredible sense of humour. And um, I, yeah, I, I just think it's that, that maybe it's a Catholic thing, you know, where you actually want to do the right thing by people and you want to make things better. Um, I've, I've had discussions with this, you know, I'm, I'm kind of uh, described as a conscious you know, the conscience of the boards that I'm on as well. So I think, you know, marrying those things, they're quite rare because normally, you know, around boards we've got these, you know, they can be quite dour. There are three types of laughing, you know, the audit committee, the ha, ha, and then they all laugh 
off in sort of different ways, but they're pretty dire, dire serious type things. But you know, you're, you're in the trenches together. Yeah. You, and um, so I just think, you know, if we, that diversity, equity, you know, one of the things I love about boards is we all get paid the same amount of money. Um, and that happens very rarely. So, um, you know, there have been times when I've been the only female on, on uh, three of my boards. And, you know, I feel as if I have a responsibility to all women. Um, and, and, you know, but even amongst women, that a lot say, I don't have a responsibility to anyone other than myself. Men don't feel that, so why should I? But I, I've always felt, you know, that if I can show that, you know, that we can contribute, we can bring something fresh and different, um, one of my girlfriends, when I was starting my board career, said, just learn how to think like a man. I'd say, well, what's the point of that? You know, that would be ridiculous. I need to bring something completely different to the table. And it's not that we necessarily all think differently, but we all do have different attributes we can bring to every situation. And I think, you know, if I can make it, it should make everyone much more, <laughs> you know, feel much more um, capable of doing anything they choose to, it's, you know, because I... I just made things, I went through open doors. Yeah. I think love comes into it. Thank you for that. Uh, I think we're going to open it up now to the general room. If anyone has any questions that they'd like to throw on up to us. If you do have a question, can you say your name before you start so we can know who you are? And is there anyone who would have anything on the top of their head? Good on you, Georgie. <laughs> yes, yeah, so my name's Georgie. But one of my questions, Megan, when you know you lead a very busy lifestyle, lots of different work experiences as well as roles, what were some things or that you do like to do to sort of relax or unwind? Mm. Well, I have two gorgeous daughters and um, you know, they've kept me busy. My eldest has had a chronic illness um, for seven years. So I was her carer um, as well. So that, that was busy time for our family. And again, I designed my working career, because I'm the primary breadwinner. Um, I, you know, and I love working. Um, I'm, I'll always work in some capacity. But I needed to have a job where I, so I stopped speaking, stopped consulting because I couldn't commit to anything with Imogen's health. Um, so there wasn't much, much relaxation for a long time. I'm just very, very lucky that, that my child has, is out the other side. I have absolute admiration and respect and empathy for carers and um, parents of, of sick and disabled children. So now it's, my time, and uh, Imogen, I'm really happy to say, is doing incredibly well, and um, so I'm looking after myself finally, and which I think as, as women we, you know, tend not to do so well, um, and, but now, mum's always said, you must look after us, it's, it's like the oxygen mask, right? But um, we were in, a, in a, a, an acute period where she, I felt, and I'm a bit, you know, mushy, I'm a bit soft probably, but, but now I'm painting. I share a studio with um, real artists and uh, they're professional artists and, and I share a space and I've started painting again and that's very good for the soul and, um, and I'm enjoying it. So, so yeah, but I, I, and yeah, just being with my family, my, my immediate family and then all of these people, <laughs> all of these women, and, you know, very, very lucky and my beautiful friends, enriched by all of them. Same friends as I've had for a long, long time. Very pragmatic, good, good people. That was a nice, easy one. <gasps> this is my niece, Claudia. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a really good question, Claudia. Um, learn about compound interest. <laughs> yeah, that's the big one. Um, you know, I, I've made so many mistakes, Claudie. There have been so many extraordinary highs and really deep lows, and I've learned far more from the lows 
Um, I probably wouldn't change much, but I learn from it and then apply it and make sure that I don't make those mistakes again and, and become a better person. So probably exercise more and learn about compounding. <laughs> Megan, thanks for coming. My name is Beatrice Tanarski. I'm an alumni. I just want to ask you the question, like during your extraordinary career, have you had any roadblocks that are specifically you don't feel that you would have come up against if, if you weren't a woman? So what, do you feel that there's some patriarchal moment where you could see that it was really a boys club, you wanted to move forward, but there was resistance and how did you get through that moment? It's a great question. Um, and this is an annoying answer because I actually didn't. But I think it's one because I remember my first job, there were probably a couple of, there was an older, excuse me, an older guy I can remember whom I annoyed and he, I had, I was given Australia's biggest clients which were Forex and um, Mirage back in the day. Both, of the, both owners went to jail, but anyway, there were huge <laughs> accounts for um, Australia. And I, um, I'm a lover, not a fighter. I don't have, um, I don't think like a lot of aggressive animals. So I just head down, bottom up, kept doing what I was doing. And, you know, navigated that. Because I haven't worked in the corporate industry, I'm not in banking, I'm not in law, I, where I have witnessed um, a lot of glass ceilings and a lot of um, inappropriate behaviours and attitudes. But because I was in creative and then a, a startup, and then it was actually men who, you know, fathers, my girls, another girl's grandma, two of the fathers, um, you know, thought I should go on to boards. Um, so I've had men and women support me, be, be fantastic cheerleaders. So, but I'm, that is my experience. Um, and, but I, you know, recently I had a bit of a kapow with a director, which I've never had. Um, and he, he, we were in a taxi actually here in Brisbane going out to the airport. And um, he actually let me know in no uncertain terms what he thought of something I'd said. I was protecting a female lawyer. I thought she was overloaded. We were going through the, this lawyer, male lawyer, fantastic brilliant, the three of them were brilliant. He had one siloed area, huge. This other guy from Sydney, siloed area, huge remit. The female, wonderful woman, in fact, she turns out to be a friend of my brother Peter's. She had a huge, broad, 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 it went on and on and on in the smallest team. And I made a comment, and this director spoke to me um, in, the, in the car on the way to the airport. And, it, you know, it was really interesting, I just listened to him, I held my ground um, because it was I, it was respectful listening, and then I respected myself <laughs> in answering him in why I said it, and um, and then that was kind of met. I met it head on, and uh, and didn't hold on to it. So, but you know, I have been lucky, and I do absolutely understand that women in so many areas um, have shocking, shocking experiences. I have to also say that men are, you know, when I was consulting to Westpac, I would arrive on every floor and notice that I was the oldest person on every floor. And then I would seek out other old people and there were, you know, these little groups of men and they weren't even as old as me, they're in their late 40s probably, who would still have mortgages and kids in private schools and stuff and they all just disappeared. So there's an ageism as well. There are, you know, there are, you know, problems across all genders, across, um, you know, all ages. I used to be the youngest in the room, now I'm one of the oldest. You know, it's, it's just being aware of that and understanding that we all bring something unique and we can all contribute um, to every situation. Uh, thanks for your wonderful speakers. Talk this morning, I'm Naomi. Um, there's been a lot of discussion around, around fashion and sustainability. Yeah. And for someone who grew up in the 70s and is still probably owns things that I had in the 70s because I you know, can't throw anything out, yeah. um, and I still get a pang of guilt every time I order something new, how 
Can you, have you considered a way out or, or have you had thoughts around this or? Yeah, that's a really good question. And one of the businesses that I'm involved in is a plus size fashion site at the value end of, of the chain. But I always wanted to support that because at net porte we just weren't ca catering to women, you know, my size and, and bigger. So that inclusivity is very important to me. So this is probably one of the world's largest plus size where we're catering to an absolute need for these women who also want to look gorgeous and, and you know, um, have swimwear and gym gear and, and party dresses. But we produce a lot because it's a global company and, you know, I'm friends with the Cotton On guys and, you know, we've probably all been to Zara and H&M and stuff. It's a huge, huge issue um, and I'm hoping and you know then there's a the Bangladesh Accord and and, the, and the, not it's not just the waste of all of these materials these mountains and how they're being dumped in countries in Africa uh, which is absolutely despicable but it's you know the factories and the conditions and that, so, so it goes a long way back um, and so there needs to be changes and behaviours of the consumers as much as anything because businesses are businesses and they're going to keep creating. Um, but there are some where their absolute focus is more sustainability. You know, with ESG, we absolutely have to be more cognizant and mindful of that. We've always been very good on modern slavery and a living wage and that sort of thing. Um, you know, I'm on the board of Reese Group, which is plumbing. I do deaf industry, plumbing, plus size and, uh, and the lottery corporation. So I didn't want to be pigeonholed into just fashion or luxury, particularly because my youngest, Missy, doesn't like fashion. So I just wanted her to be proud of me and see that you can, you know, can do other stuff. But, you know, even in, in Reese, it was like, well, where are our pipes being made? And where are our, you know, so, so we all have to, um, the companies have to be more cognizant. We need to regions, you know, stop buying because of the infrastructure, but the fashion we need to buy more, we need to have less ranges, um, better quality. Um, yeah, so I have a responsibility as a director, we have responsibilities as consumers to, um, and you know, luxury is now becoming, which it should, much less, you know, much less, more defined, finite numbers of things. That's true luxury. And then small batch productions. There are some really wonderful designers in Australia doing ethically, you know, age and age athletica, size, and well, they go up to size 18, but you know, it's becoming big. But it's a, thank you for raising, it's a really, really, really important issue. Um, but I do think we all have a response, it's like the environment, right? We all have a responsibility to stop buying it. But I'm really surprised because our, my kids, you know, that they're, you know, the young people here are growing up with this awareness of the environment um, and, and worry about it, like deeply. We didn't worry so much. We, we university was free. We knew we'd get a job. We lived in this dream time. But these young people know about, you know, the environment and yet they still buy fast fashion, which kind of surprises me. There's an affordability thing, but um, I'm not suggesting you guys do, but my children, you know, do, and their friends do. They buy a lot of vintage, but, so there are sort of some disconnects as well, but a lot of work to be done, and we need to stop dumping it. Um, stop dumping these things in Africa, it's an absolute disgrace. That was a downer. <laughs> Megan, um, and Megan, I'm over here. Where are you? Megan. Oh, that, oh, it's Megan Crowley. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Sorry, I thought um, this is probably a bit more vacuous a question than Naomi's. Um, I was wondering whether in your uh, career, particularly at, you know, Netta Porte, whether there was anyone who really stood out to you um, as a great character, or really interesting, wonderful person um, that you met along the way that oh. you know, might be a nice anecdote or oh, that, a person. That's a great, that nobody's ever asked me that. No. Um, that's really interesting because I met some you know, huge people in the industry. Uh, I remember when Mario Testino 
came into our offices. He's a, a very well-known fashion photographer. Natalie and Claudia were just like beside themselves. But I was busy doing something, so I just said, oh, hi, Mario. And they were just like, what the hell? Why? You know, and so I don't get fussed by that sort of... I like people... You know, there are people who are good at their job and then people who do a good job. I get, I'm in awe of, like, nurses and paramedics. That sounds weird, but I'm much more in awe of people who actually do really extraordinary work. But there was one woman called Grace Coddington who was at American Vogue, and the, Anna Wintour is known as this kind of steely um, fashion director. And, you know, Natalie was... And, and she and Natalie have become friends... I was much more like Grace, the creative director. She had this wild hair. She was very much in her own body, moved to the beat of her own drum, which I've always done. So Grace Coddington um, and, and you know, Beth, uh, Beth, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was always, always... And Maya Angelou actually was one of my all-time, absolute all-time heroes. So, yeah, lots of women. <laughs> <laughs> but there are always people you admire, right? Always. I mean, I learned from them. I, I didn't actually have mentors per se, so I would watch and learn from people I admire and equally watch the behaviours of people I didn't admire and make sure I never <laughs> replicate that sort of thing. I love your question. <laughs> and I think we've got our final question from the other side of the room. Hello. Um, hello. I'm Chloe. I'm, I'm a Stuart Home girl. Um, I had a question in relation to you about... Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, about when you talked about the environment and how young people and fast fashion and all that, what would you say has become a hardship that has appeared in the last decade or so that you've noticed that wasn't an issue that happened maybe in the early ages? Yeah. Social media. <laughs> I would say social media. Um, I think it's been... Hugely, like there are great parts. Like when my sister Emma lived in Africa and overseas, she was able to share their experiences and 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 witness what was happening to her friends and family back here. That was a great use of social media. I think the comparisons, I think the editing of lives, the, I, you know, I, I think that's been hugely. It's a time waster. It's you know that edited news that sort of feeds preconceived ideas. I think that has been a shock in the access to pornography, access to people like Andrew Tate. You know, for young men, um, somebody like Andrew Tate and for society is hugely detrimental for young women and for young men. Um, porn, the access of porn is, is the access of, you know, to eating, to, it just, Everything is just, instead of actually being still and relaxing and being bored and talking to people, you know, we go to restaurants and then couples just don't talk, they're on their phones. So, look, there are so many, the financial, you know, education, chat GPT. This is a huge problem for universities and for students because it will just nullify um, the value of a degree if everyone has access to ChatGPT and the, and the group of eight universities, my partner is an academic, he's a philosopher and ethicist at Monash, and they just don't know how they're going to manage it. And if everyone can cheat, <laughs> they can't verbally test everyone. So what, does, what value is there in these degrees? And so that's, a, that's another challenge, but, but also, you know, whilst there are challenges, there are still extraordinary opportunities for you as young people and young women, you know, to forge your way in whatever you choose to do. Um, you don't let fear <laughs> or barriers get in the way of anything, really, as long as you do things with integrity. You know, I, I, there are always barriers. Um, as an entrepreneur, you don't wait for policies to change or you don't wait for... You actually create the change you want. So I think, you know, as young people, young women, and, and all of us can, can create the change we want so that it's a more equitable society and, and we get rid of, we talk to our boys and sons and grandsons about Andrew Tate and, and his message and we talk to each other about mental health. Um, you know, I'm from Melbourne and 
you know, we're reeling after the pandemic. There's like a, a pool of PTSD over the entire city. And it, does, it sounds dramatic, but it's actually had a huge impact to a lot of people. And we need to lean into that and we need to support each other and, and acknowledge it and then move on together. But so don't, I, I hope I didn't, I don't want to scare you. I just, I'm excited for you. You've had this amazing opportunity, education, you're surrounded by supportive women. Tap into it and, um, but, but you, we need to acknowledge the, the problems and, and address them, you know, fashion, I'm part of that problem. We need to address it. Is that? Yeah, that answers the question. I was okay. sort of, I was sort of like trying to see how, as as society has evolved in the last decade alone, how has these new hardships, but then where like also the areas that have improved and become easier. So it really depends on how we use ChatGPT and all those resources. Is that what you're trying to say? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look, we could talk forever about chat GPT. I think we keep marching blindly into progression and it's not that progressive. Um, Peter, my partner, is doing a master's at Cambridge at the moment in AI ethics. And I, you know, I'm saying, I think the horse has bolted, but it's very, very important chats to have. And he's also done a course with Tim Berners-Brooks who, who invented the internet, who says, this isn't actually what I planned. So we just have to be, conscious of how we use things. Just because we can doesn't mean we should. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Chloe. Good question. And as we close, is there anything else that's on the tip of your tongue that you'd like to share with everyone today? No. I, think, I just think it's lovely. Thank you for coming. I hope, I hope you found it interesting. And it's just lovely to see such you know, vibrant women supporting each other and, and, um, and you know, discussing. I thought this what Sister Carol said earlier was, was magnificent. And it's true. And it's just so, so far beyond um, you know, these shores. Women in other countries are really, really doing it tough. And I just, you know, I'm a bit of a feminist, and I don't think we should take things for granted anything for granted we should even if we, it doesn't affect us and we don't agree with it we shouldn't let anything go because we we need to be at the table we bring so much economic value to environments our safety raises you know there's families are better health are better when women are at the table in some capacity no matter what capacity as long as we all have a voice so we just need to keep supporting each other which you're doing so thank you for having me So once again, if we can just give Megan another round of applause to say thank you very much for being here. <laughs> Megan, I think you all sort of took many of us in the room here back to our first days at Stuart Home where you started um, with that conversation. So um, thank you for sharing insights on your journey, starting at your Stuart Home days you know, your adventures in the UK and what's brought you back home here to Australia as well. I note that, uh, Megan, you made reference to, uh, I want to make things better for b having been there. And I can certainly tell you here today, you've definitely made this morning much better. So thank you very much, Megan, for your time and travelling up to Brisbane. Please accept this small gift um, as a very big thank you. Oh, fantastic.